This is going to include everything that you need to know to get yourself driving on the road with your driving instructor, with your parent, whoever it is you're planning to learn to drive with. This is going to be short, this is going to be to the point, it's gonna have everything you need. The beauty of this is you can come to the video, get a bit, go and learn that, come back, get a little bit more, and so on and so forth. The idea of this video is to save you lots and lots of money because if you can practice some of these bits at home, you aren't going to need as many driving lessons. If you can get some of these things done in the car, on your driveway, rather than paying 30, 35 pound an hour inside a driving instructor's car, then why not? I am Josh, your humble driving instructor. If you have any questions or any comments, get them in the description. No, get them in the comments below. <laughs>
and half the ground. Be careful when doing this because if you're on a hill, that's not going to work. So you need to be on the flat. The second thing you're going to cover on your driving lessons is controls and instruments of the car. Now, these are things like gear stick, how to hold the gear stick, how to change gear, how to signal, how to use the handbrake if you've got an automated handbrake or just a standard handbrake. How do you open and close the windows? If it rains, how are you going to turn the wet wipers on? Or even windscreen wipers, wet wipers. How do you steer the wheel? How do you hold the wheel? How do you press the pedals? Where are the pedals and which pedals do what? These are all the really important points that you're going to need to know on your second driving lesson. Now, again, you're probably going to be quite stressed on your first lesson with this. These are all things you're going to need to know on your first driving lesson. And you're going to be feeling under a lot of pressure. So don't worry if you don't take every single bit in, but you've got to try your best. Now, this is something you could quite easily do at home in mum and dad's car. You don't need to go anywhere at all. You can sit and you can learn how to change the gears, how to press the signal. What are the pedals and what do they do? How much should you press the pedals? How does the handbrake work? because each of these things are probably going to take between five and ten minutes for you to do in your driving instructor's car which means if you put that into money scale you're going to be spending a approximately five pounds learning each part of the vehicle. You're also going to need to learn how to use the dash. What are the rev counters for? How do you know when to change gear? How do you know how fast you're going? So my biggest tip for you learning instruments is make sure that you learn to palm the gear stick when you change gear, okay? And that's just meaning use the flat of your hand, ideally the palm of your hand to push the gear stick left and right, never on top. Because when you're on top, your wrist is a lot weaker and that's when you end up going into the wrong gear. And if you're in the wrong gear when you're driving along, it can be eventful. Okay, so next on the syllabus, we're finally gonna get this hunk of metal moving with moving off and stopping, which I'm sure you'll agree is very important because once you move, you also need to be able to stop the car. Now for this particular part of the syllabus, you're going to want to pick a really quiet area like we're going to do now. I'd expect you to spend between two and eight hours in this area. Uh, depending on how quickly you take to it and depending on how busy it is uh, you really need to practice this and make sure you're super confident because these skills that you actually use here you're going to use everywhere else uh, you're going to be using it when you go to roundabouts junctions these are all skills that you will share throughout your driving experience so to get comfortable with driving the best thing to do is stick to a nice quiet area at the beginning now you are also going to be asked to pull over and move off at least three times on your driving test probably a lot more than that if you aren't doing something correctly so this is a really important thing to do at home and again if you are watching this you should learn this inside and out before your driving lessons to save yourself a lot of money okay the easiest way to learn this routine is actually POM. P for prepare, O for observe, M for move away. So make sure you've got a belt on, you've done the cockpit drill, we know how the instruments of the car work. Next, it's the P for prepare. We always use the POM routine anytime we are in a parked position. And we do it like this. P is for prepare. So we prepare the car by putting the clutch down, popping it into first gear using the palming technique, getting the bite of the car by gently touching the gas, setting it around 1.5 thousand revs, and bringing the clutch up to the bite point. Then we have a look through the back window to make sure no one's coming from that direction. Then the mirror, then the central mirror, nothing's behind us. Then the right mirror, oh, there is a car behind us. Then the right mirror, there's still a car behind us. And then the blind spot, and there is still a car behind us. The most important place you can look is that blind spot because there will be a car there when you least expect it. So more than a few seconds, we check that blind spot again. It is clear, so we have done the O for observe and we are bringing that clutch up slightly more. I have an auto handbrake and off we go. We lift that clutch up when we get about above the five miles an hour speed and we're off. Now the problem is we are going to need to pull back over. So to do this, we check our central mirror, we check our left mirror while keeping the wheel very straight. Don't start driving towards the curb. Central mirror, left mirror, we pop a signal on and we gently move ever so slightly towards the curb before straightening back up to keep a nice even distance from the curb. Then we put the car into neutral. We take our feet off the paddles, providing the handbrakes on as well. Again, my car's also handbrake. I'm gonna turn that off. I'm gonna turn that off. That's it. So lift the handbrake and we are set to rest our feet. We also turn the signal off. Let's do that one more time. So palm routine, clutch down into first, get a bite, back window, side mirror, central mirror, 
front windscreen, right mirror, blind spot over the back window, make sure there's nothing coming. If it is clear, we can pop a signal on because there's someone in front of us, so we need to let them know, and we're gently moving away. Over. We want to check our central mirror and our left mirror because we are moving the car over to the left ever so slightly. Then we gently start to touch the brake just to bring the car to a slower speed and we put the clutch down approximately up to three car lengths away from where you're going to stop. We then pull the handbrake, put the car into neutral and pop the signal off and we can rest our feet. <sighs> Breathe. The next part of the driving syllabus is safe positioning. And this is where it starts to get a little bit more fluid, a little bit more complicated, because safe positioning isn't something that you can actually teach in just one driving lesson. Safe positioning is something you'll teach and learn in every driving lesson that you have up until the day that you pass your driving test. And even then, you will still make mistakes and you still will learn safe positioning after that as well because safe positioning changes depending on the situation safe positioning involves where would you normally drive going down a completely straight road it involves where would you position if you're turning left or turning right at a junction it involves how far you should be from another vehicle let's have a look at a few examples of safe positioning okay safe positioning on this particular road as you can see i'm quite central in the road if you're unsure of where central of the road is try and make sure your left leg feels pretty central in the lane and this is normally a good indicator if your left leg's feeling pretty central in the lane, chances are you are center of the lane. Again, even going around the bend, I'm trying to keep my left leg central in the lane, or you can use the top of your wheel. If the top of your wheel looks central to, to the road, uh, then you are probably going to be central to the road. Correct positioning for a roundabout depends on the roundabout. This particular one is a spiral roundabout and I want to go straight on, which means I need to position myself in the lane that has an arrow going straight on. I then need to position myself to make sure that I stay between the lines. Here's a really important tip for you. If you're ever unsure of the speed limit on a road, look for street lights. If you see street lights and you can't see any speed signs, chances are it's going to be 30 miles an hour. This is a 99% chance that it's going to be 30 miles an hour, okay? If you don't see street lights and no speed signs, chances are it's going to be a national speed limit. This road, for instance, a lot of people get this road wrong because they say it's clear, it looks like a 40. Never look like a 40. If it has street lights, it is a 30 until you see a speed sign. If you're on your driving test and you do 30 uh, and it's actually a 40 or a 50, you will still pass your test because you'll see those signs in about 10 to 15 seconds and then you can speed up. If you do 40 and a 30 on your driving test, you will automatically fail. So we're coming to some traffic lights on a crossroads. So for our position for turning left here, we're going to want to be ever so slightly closer to the curb just to show our positioning we are actually turning left, but not so close that it's uncomfortable. Now, safe positioning on bumps ideally is to try and position the white line on the top of the wheel. If you do that, you should hit the bump fairly central, causing as little bumps as possible. If this isn't possible, you need to slow your car down to the absolute minimum speed. And you'll know, and this changes depending on the bump, and you'll know if it's the right speed or not, because it won't have a dramatic effect on the car. If your car's bouncing up and down and all around, that's not the correct speed. Okay, so we have a parked hit car here. So the correct positioning for this is to check my mirrors and make sure I'm a door's width from the vehicles. When the vehicles are clear, I check my central and left mirror and just move back across. Again, I'm trying to stay in the center of my lane as much as possible, but we have some parked vehicles on the right side here, which means it's my job to move across as the driver to closer to the curb to allow people to get past should they want to. Again, we have more parked vehicles on the right and we actually have one on the left, so it's a central and right mirror check just to make sure it's clear. I'm gonna to have to slow down for the bump this time because I can't hit it square. Try to stay a door's width from that vehicle and go as central as possible. Okay, we have parked vehicles on the right, so I'm moving across to the curb. Now we've got parked cars on both sides, so I need to slow down and assess the situation a bit more. There is room for two vehicles, so I am just nice and slowly going through, and that's the important key thing with positioning. The tighter it gets, the slower you need to go. 
So now we're coming to a very busy meeting traffic road and it's all about looking ahead and looking for positions, trying to make progress and at the same time looking for somewhere where you need to pull in. So for instance, after this van and this car, I can see there's a nice pull in there if I need to, should I need to. At the moment, I don't. Um, I'm just going to stay a door's width from these vehicles at all times, just in case someone opens that door on me. There is a vehicle coming, so I am just trying to stay a door's width at the appropriate speed, but I can see there is space down this road because there's only vehicles parked on one side and it's a reasonably wide road. You're going to have to assess this depending on your particular road that you're on. All I'm looking for down here at the same time is looking for spaces on the left side. I'm choosing a nice slow speed to give myself time to think. The slower you go, the more time you have to think. And as a learner, that is so important. Time is money. Time is learning. Time is everything. Give yourself lots of time. Go slower. Okay, again, it's wide enough. This car here has just slowed down just to let me come through at the end there. This is an interesting one. We have a mini roundabout again, and again, it forks either left or it forks right. I need to give way to my right, so it's a funny fork, so I'm just locking to make sure it's clear. I'm not actually going to signal for this one because there is a junction directly after the mini roundabout, which could be construed that I'd be turning left there. Does it matter? Probably not. Now we're going to turn right on these crossroads, so I need to position myself nice and early in the right lane that shows people for turning right. Let me check my mirrors and pop that signal on. And then I'm just rolling gently to the line, nice and slowly. Uh, position here, I need to position myself nice and central in the road without invading the right-hand lane. If I invade the right-hand lane, they will not be able to get past, which would be unsafe. So I wait in the middle while the lights are green until it's clear. Once it's clear, I then continue on in my direction. I have the least priority there because I'm crossing someone else's path. It is their priority and I have to give way to them. We are now back in a central driving position on the sneaky 30 road that looks 40. The next part of the syllabus is use of mirrors. And again, you're going to be using your mirrors throughout your driving lessons and hopefully well into your old age. Essentially, mirrors stop you crashing. It's simple as that. Let's have a look, think about an example, okay? So we're in a supermarket, we're rushing about, okay, maybe there's a barbecue on, last minute, get all that food. You grab something, you spin around, there's someone right there, you walk into them, then you've got the awkward, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I stepped on your toes blah, blah, blah. Would you have walked into them if you knew they were there? Obviously, you wouldn't have. Driving's the same. If you knew that person was there, you wouldn't have driven into the side of them. If you're checking your mirrors regularly and sensibly like you should be doing, then you won't drive into anyone, or hopefully not. The simple fact is get good at using your mirrors effectively, that's the word, effective use of mirrors, and you'll be a safe and confident driver. And I can honestly say the quicker you get used to using your mirrors, the less driving lessons you're going to need. It is such a key part of your driving lessons, and it's going to give you a lot more confidence when you start to actually know what's going on around you. And the key here is actually effective observations. What I mean by that, it's not the case of driving along and just constantly staring at three mirrors all the way around like a yo-yo. It's a case of when you need to use a set of mirrors, that's when you use a set of mirrors. Let's have a look at a few examples of what I mean. So we're coming up to a right-hand turn here. So because I'm turning right, I need to make sure nothing's overtaking and nothing's behind me that's going to affect me. So I check my central, my right mirror. And once I've seen that it's clear and safe, I pop a signal on. I can then safely focus on the rest of the process of actually turning the car. Now in this instance, we've got a car parked on the left but we also have a junction. So I could check my mirrors and I could signal here, but if I did do that, I'd very well likely confuse someone and make them think that I'm turning down that junction when they could already see the parked car there anyway, so there's no point. Now in this instance, we're coming to the end of the road. We can see the end of the road and we're planning to turn left. So in this case, I wanna make sure there's not a cyclist or anything sneaking down here like the new e-scooters, central mirror, left mirror, pop that signal on and then we're ready to turn. Mirrors are all about trying to make sure that we know what everyone else around us is doing. And if we take our eyes off the mirrors for a few seconds, that can change very, very quickly because cars are very, very fast. So again, we're having to come out across the road ever so slightly here. So we do very quickly just check our central and left mirror. We don't need to worry too much about that left mirror because the car wasn't moving left in that particular instance. We're actually gonna pull over on the side of the road now, which means I need to make sure there is nothing coming up on the inside. So I check my central and my left mirror before signaling and then gently brake and put the clutch down. 
Next up, we have use of signals. And hopefully, once again, use of signals is something that you should be doing for your entire driving life not in just one lesson, well, let's hope not. Now, use of signals is slightly different to use of mirrors because use of mirrors is quite selfish. It's more about you and making sure you are safe on the road and you aren't crashing. Apart from those ambulances, you know, that's not selfish. That's you getting out the way of the ambulances, out of the way of the police cars, that sort of thing. Whereas use of signals is about helping other people. When you signal, that is for other drivers, other pedestrians, everyone else around you. It's not for you because you know where you're going. So does anyone in your car. So when we use signals, it's always a balance between how useful a signal is and how confusing a signal is. And there's always going to be a slight element of both of those in that. What we need to try and do is always try and make sure we weigh those scales heavier towards the usefulness and a lot less on the confusing. If it is ending up more on the confusing side, chances are you probably shouldn't bother signaling in that situation. I'll show you what I mean. So we have a left-hand junction coming up. There's a lot of driveways here, but it's very unlikely someone's going to think I'm going to pull into there especially if I'm not slowing down. So I want to check my mirrors and pop a signal on about three or four seconds before the junction. It's pretty clear that I'm easing off the gas, so I'm going to be taking this junction. So that is a good signal. That's a good option for a signal. Here we have a parked car with a junction on the right. Now I could signal to say I'm going around the parked car, but people are likely to think I'm going into the junction. They can see the car, so there's actually no point in signaling. So I wouldn't advise generally signaling around a parked car unless you are driving a bus, a lorry, or a large goods vehicle that you need to let people know because they can't see past you. Again, we're coming to the end of the road here, about three to four, three to five seconds before we get to the junction, pop that left signal on just to let those people know and register that you are actually planning to turn. So as I say, sometimes you might ask yourself, should I be signaling at that roundabout? Most of the time, the answer is going to be, yes, you should. There's going to be the odd few occasion where you're thinking that might be quite confusing. In those situations, you need to make the decision whether it's a helpful signal or a bit of a hindrance. Next, we have anticipation and planning. This is possibly my favorite one because I always refer to it and think of it as a game of chess that only you are playing. And basically it involves anticipating for what's going to happen, such as a light changing to red or a light changing to green and actually planning ahead for that. And the reason I like it because it saves monies, it saves time and it saves hassle. If you don't have to go into first gear all the time, it's gonna be a far easier, far smoother and far more enjoyable drive. But in order to do this, you have to brake early, you have to anticipate earlier and you have to be looking really far down the road. Let's have a look at a few examples. Again, anticipating there's red lights ahead. So I'm slowing down nice and early to encourage this car behind me to slow down a little bit earlier rather than flying into the back of this car and slamming the brake on in the last few seconds. This also gives me a better chance of the lights changing and like this, I can carry on rolling, waste a lot less fuel, have to mess about a lot less trying to get the bite and continue on. Oh. oh yeah. Okay, I'm looking ahead. I've spotted the signs because I'm anticipating what's ahead. I'm planning ahead. I've got good awareness. I can see there's national speed limit signs there. So that means this road is now officially a 60 mile per hour road because it's a single carriageway. Is it safe to do 60 miles an hour down here? I don't think so. You've got houses, you've got cars on the other side, parked cars. And if you look ahead, our point of vision is very limited to this extremely sharp bend with a slow sign. So this is a national speed limit road with a slow sign and a bend like this. So this is why it's so important that you're looking ahead as far as you can at all times and you're completely aware of your surroundings. Again, this is national speed limit road, but is it safe? No, it's 25 miles an hour max. Again, limited vision here. So I've eased off the gas. There's a slow sign on the road. Two things that I've picked up on to say, this is a slow down. Sharp bend to the right sign. So again, I've come off the gas and doing 19 miles per hour around this bend, sticking to the outside. Really important that you try your best to stick to the outside, not the inside, because that's where the other cars are going to be. If you're in the UK, that is. Another slow sign. So again, easing off the gas, a big bridge here. I'm gonna drop it into second, so I've got a bit more acceleration. Single track here, there's no car, so I have continued on. And we are coming to a mini roundabout. The most slippy time you can get is when it's been a very dry few days or few weeks and then suddenly it rains because the rain starts to wash away and dilute 
all the fluid that has leaked out of cars, oil, and whatever else is on the road, and it creates a nice slippery mess. Something to keep in mind. Still very clear down the road. I'm still at around 55. Uh, I don't feel like going much faster than this. It's not narrow at all, especially if another vehicle comes. I am hugging the white line, which is absolutely fine, especially as there's nothing else coming at the moment. But should something else come, look at this. How did you spot it? The slow sign, that is key. You need to look out for your slow signs on rural roads. They are imperative. You see the corner coming up? We can't see round the corner, um, which shows us we need to slow down. So I've slowed right down to 35 miles per hour at the moment. And I'm continuing at that because it's very windy and bendy. Okay, so this is still a national speed limit road. Keep that in mind. But there's no possible way we could go at a national speed limit of 60 miles per hour. Warning sign, cows. Is that real? Is that really gonna happen? Then we have a warning of a danger ca cattle crossing with a light on top. Yes, it could potentially happen. In fact, there is a lorry pulling out of it right now. Then we have a very sharp looking bend. We can't see around the corner at all. And there's a sign, so I'm slowing right down to 20 miles per hour. It is clear, but as you can imagine with that, if there is a lorry coming, it can get rather interesting. Keep it in mind. Okay, look at this sign. You won't see this very often, okay? This is a 90 degree bend sign. For this, I'm going to need to go down to second gear. You've had the warning of a sign. You've got two more warnings right there that's a sharp bend, and you can see it's a bridge and it's sharp. I'm down to nine miles per hour. That's your lot. That's what warnings you have with that particular area. Uh, with areas like that, that's why you have to pick up on them. And that's still a national speed limit road. Now we have here, you can see the 40 mile per hour speed limit, and there is a big sign there called a stop sign. So what do we do at stop signs? We must stop. Again, we have a national speed limit road here, and this is very rural, so once again, you will see it would not be safe to go national speed limit. And this is where you have to make your own decisions on what's safe. Now, how do you drive on a particular single road like this? Well, the most important thing is to look at the furthest possible point and give yourself the best view. That means you do not have to hug the hedge, and I wouldn't hug the hedge unless a vehicle is coming or you're going to a corner. Now, there is a corner coming up. I'm actually moving out slightly because it's going to give me a better view around the corner. With a better view around the corner, it means it's going to be easier for me to prepare and see other vehicles, and more importantly, for them to see me. Again, almost see around the corner, so I'm actually leaning and I'm moving out slightly so I can see further around the corner and they can see me. If they can see you and you can see them, you can prepare far easier and far quicker, far safer. Again, moving out, not in, so I can see further around the corner. If a vehicle did come, then yes, I would very quickly and gently, well, I say quickly, the car would be slowing down, but I would be moving the wheel to start moving across to the left side. Okay, I've spotted the roundabout sign coming up ahead, so I can already mentally prepare for that. I can see traffic lights, they've been green for a while. It's a 30 zone as well, so I'm anticipating that they may change. I'm still doing my normal speed, but there you go. I, because I've already got it in my head, I'm ready to brake. I'm not gonna suddenly be shell-shocked when they do change. If you're at a roundabout and there's traffic lights, and they've been green a while, you need to really think they are going to change, okay? Pedestrian crossing, for instance, they might not change. They're less likely to change unless there's obviously a pedestrian waiting, but traffic lights on a roundabout, a lot higher chance. So which lights am I looking at? I've got one there, I've got one there, and I've got one there. Which one's the easiest to look at? It's the one straight ahead. So that's the one I'm looking at. There we go, the lights have gone green. I'm sticking to my lane, we're following the road ahead. Okay, I'm anticipating there's green lights at the moment, there's also a yellow box, I need to be aware of that. There's no traffic in front, so I'm not gonna get stuck in the yellow box. There's people waiting at the pedestrian crossing, so what's it likely to do? They're likely to change very soon. They didn't change on me, however. Again, we've got green lights here at a crossroad, so they are going to change at some point soon. Again, it's my lucky day. So I can see there's lots of traffic in front. I'm not looking at the car in front, I'm looking all the way to the end as far as I can see. Okay, because if I can, it's like a snake. You know, the back's gonna do what the front does, like dominoes. If the front car's going to stop or the lights at the end of the road change, I know what every other car's going to do. So I'm already preparing for what I'm going to need to do, which is slow down. If I stare at the back car, I've got very little time to anticipate when I need to brake. That's when driving is scary. You'll get far more comfortable at driving when you learn to look as far as you can 
down the road. That's one of the main things in learning to drive. It's looking as far down the road as you possibly can. Have you ever heard of the MSPSL routine? My advice, learn this quick, learn it at home by any means necessary, whether that's YouTube videos, whether that's repeating it over and over, whether that's diagrams, anything. The quicker you learn this routine, the quicker you're going to pass your driving test, the less lessons you're going to need. Trust me, this will save you a lot of money when you get this routine down. Now, the abbreviation, I know it sounds long-winded, MSPSL stands for mirrors signal, positioning, speed, and it is actually what we use on junctions. And this is all junctions. This is left turns, right turns, following the road ahead, pulling over on the left, and those roundabout junctions as well. Now, the reason this routine is so important is because it's exactly that. It's a routine. And humans like to follow routines. We learn things a lot quicker when we get into a habit and a routine of doing the same thing over and over. If you mix it up, you're going to have a far harder time of approaching those roundabouts and those junctions correctly, which is going to take you longer to learn to drive, and it's going to cost you a lot more money. So here's an example. Let's have a look. Now, this routine can be applied to every part of your drive. For example, if we are pulling over on the left, we do our mirrors, we do our signal, we do our positioning, which is closer to the curb, we do our braking, which is clutched down, which is affecting our speed and our locking of where to stop. Then we stop the car, neutral, handbrake, turn her off. We also apply it to junctions. We're coming to the end of the road, we're turning left. So we do our mirrors, we do our signal, we do our positioning, which is going to be slightly more on the left, and we do our speed, which is slowing down, and we do our locking. And after that's cut this car, it's clear. So I'm continuing on. And where it really helps is with the roundabouts. As we approach the roundabout, we are planning to turn left. So we do our mirrors nice and early. We then do our signals. We then check our positionings following the curb on the left or using the left lane. We then check our speed by slowing down and making sure we're in the, the correct gear. And then we do our locking with plenty of time before we get to the roundabout, giving ourselves time to decide whether we're going to stop, whether we're going to go, deciding on what the plan of action actually is. Now, as I said before, this routine applies to absolutely everything, whether that's getting onto a slip road, whether that's pulling over on the side of the road, whether that's turning right or left on a crossroads. The quicker you learn that routine, the easier your learning to drive experience and driving in general experience is going to be. You're also going to be expected to learn how to actually manage a roundabout. We have spiral roundabouts. We have normal standard roundabouts. We have mini roundabouts and you manage them all slightly differently. For example, spiral roundabouts. You just make sure you stay in your lane. Mini roundabouts. You only signal if you're going left or you're going right. We do not bother signaling if we are going straight up. And then you have your standard roundabout where you position yourself on the right so we're coming to a mini roundabout. Now, here I'm actually planning to turn right. So I've got a central mirror and a right mirror. Do not signal coming off the roundabout. So it's just a right signal. I check that it's clear to the right and I take the roundabout. I do not need to signal off just because there's not going to be time to actually signal off. There's going to be of any benefit to anyone else. Because the roundabout's so small, you treat it more like a junction with signals with just that right signal or just that left signal. Okay, so here we have our first example of a spiral roundabout. Okay, you can tell it's a spiral roundabout because both arrows point straight on, but there is no straight on, which means the only place it can be is right. So what's really important on a spiral roundabout is that you stay in your lane. That is the primary thing with a spiral roundabout. Stay in your lane, whatever happens. Now, most spiral roundabouts are traffic light controlled, but this one isn't, which means you've also got to make sure it's clear. So I'm staying in the outside of the roundabout the whole time, I'm really focused on staying the outside because I'm using the left lane and I have to come off in the left lane. I can't come off in the right lane because that's the lane I chose to enter the roundabout on. That's the difference between a spiral roundabout and a normal roundabout. Now a spiral roundabout will always have arrows so you'll know which lane to be in. Well, they do normally have arrows unless they're rubbed off. 
Appropriate speed, what does this actually mean? Because, you know, car, because, you know, roads do have speed limits, but these are, as they say in the word, an absolute limit. That does not always mean it's safe to go that speed on the road. For instance, the biggest question I get on lots of country roads is there is no way it's safe to go 60 miles per hour, the national speed limit on this road. And you are absolutely right. On rural roads, on those national speed limit roads, the signs are there to say, this is the absolute limit but you need to use your common sense to decide on what is a safe speed. Sometimes that's 20 miles an hour, sometimes that's 30 miles an hour. I know of one which is just 10 miles an hour. You have to make your, that decision by using the environment and using your eyes and planning ahead to decide on what speed is safe. Let's have a look at a few other examples. So this particular road that we're actually on right now is a residential area. It is a 30 miles per hour road. However, there are no lines. It's not very wide at all. And because it's residential, there's probably going to be a lot of people and children and everything else that you do not want to be going fast speeds for. Which means I'm gonna take this road closer to 20 miles an hour to be safe. Now saying that, we've come to the end of the road and we're onto a major road now. And as you can see on this particular road, there are lines on the center of the road showing that this is a slightly wider road and showing that it is slightly safer perhaps to go closer to 30. Although I am still good doing around 25 because it does feel comfortable. It does also depend on how many vehicles are parked on the road. If you're gonna to have to go in and out, then again, you're going to need to slow down. Basically the tighter it gets, the busier it gets, the slower you need to go. And that's a really important thing to learn. So we have four cars parked on the right hand side here, but it is close. I'm still just touching the brake and staying nice and close to that curb in case another vehicle comes. Because we're turning right, we're going to hug the central line and stopping at the line. It is safe for me to go, so I'm pulling out. And that is safe positioning. Okay, on to... Now, at some point, we needed to talk about traffic on the road. And this is actually more of a mindset than an actual technique. And it's a basically learning defensive driving. And there's a link below if you want to hear more about defensive driving, but it really is a mindset. And defensive driving is essentially trying to help prevent accidents at every point. It's about doing everything in your power to try and prevent accidents and help other people on the road. It's about not aggressive driving, not bullying your way out and trying to actually help each other. Quick example of this, if someone goes to overtake you on the other side of the road and there is a car coming down the road, they've cut it a little bit fine. Now you've got three options here. You can see this person is going to struggle to get back in before the other car gets to you, which could potentially cause a serious accident. Option one, you can speed up you show them who's boss, make them get back in behind you. Option two, you, you can go at the same speed that you're already going at, let them struggle on, they might just about make it hopefully. Or option three, you can slow down and help this person get back onto your side of the road hopefully preventing an accident with the car on the other side of the road, which for all we know could be a mum with three kids. And it's just trying to get your frame of mind into that particular way of thinking. It's about when we've got a meeting traffic situation that's only space for one car to come through. It's about sometimes taking, being proactive and actually pulling in to let the other person go rather than waiting to the last second, hoping that they're gonna pull in and then no one pulls and then you end up with that awkward situation where someone's having to reverse. Easily avoidable and far quicker to be proactive. Different types of crossings. We have zebra crossings, we have toucan crossings, we have pelican crossings. And it's a case of you understanding how to approach each of those crossings and what are the actual rules with those crossings. For example, are we aware that at zebra crossings, you should not enter the zebra crossing if someone is nearby or about to cross on that zebra crossing. You should also not move away until the person's feet have actually left the crossing, even if they're on the other side of the road. Next, we have dual carriageways. Now with dual carriageways, uh, there's different types and this particular one is the slip road style, which you'd probably be doing on your driving test in most cases. And if you're not, it's still really, really important that you understand how to do this particular dual carriageway because it's actually very similar to a motorway. And the worst thing you can do is not be prepared to go on motorways after you pass your test um, because otherwise you'll end up avoiding motorways, which shouldn't be um, what you're doing. 
they're very quick, they're very easy roads to use, providing you're prepared and you've learned how to use them. So with the dual carriageways, the really important things that you need to be learning to do are keeping the correct distance with those vehicles in front. Only a fool ignores a two second rule. This just means making sure that you are staying approximately two seconds from the vehicle, absolute minimum at all times. The other really important points are how to get off a slip road and how to get back on a slip road. For instance here, we have a slip road coming up. So as we approach, we do use our mirrors and our signal, check our positioning's fine. Uh, the speed we would keep the same until we're off the dual carriageway, we don't slow down at all, and then we come off. As we come off, we can see there's lights in 220 yards, so I'm starting to slow down on the slip road. That's when you start to slow down, not on the dual carriageway. Obviously, unless there's traffic, if there's cars coming at you, uh, if there's a traffic jam, then you will want to slow down. Again, we are now on a slip road. This is actually a separate lane that can lead you off, but it's the same principle. We need to get back onto this dual carriageway. So we check our mirrors, we pop a signal on, but what's really important, and people forget here, is to check the blind spot. Just make sure there's not a car sitting here on your right, because even if you look in that mirror, that will not show you if there is a car in the blind spot. Trust me, if you don't trust me, get your friend to stand in the blind spot, have a look at your mirror, and you'll see that you won't be able to see them. You can hide a bus in the blind spot. It's scary and you will learn one way or the other. Let's just hope you learn now from me and not when you drive into the side of a car. Apart from that on dual carriageways, it's just about keeping an eye on that central mirror as much as possible. Uh, occasionally glancing on the side mirrors, but the central one is key because it allows you to know what's coming up behind you, what's going on. You're building that picture and that's what you need to do to be a safe and comfortable driver. It also means when we approach slip roads, when we're continuing on and cars are entering, if they're ahead of us, we can decide if we can safely change lanes or not because we've been checking our central mirror. As you can see, there's no vehicle coming down this slip road, so I don't need to adjust at all. They are behind, but because they're behind, I don't need to adjust. And that is the basics of the dual carriageway. And the last couple of bits to cover for your driving syllabus is the independent driving, which actually breaks down into two separate things. You need to be able to follow signs safely and confidently. Uh, this could be part of your driving test. One in five people actually follow signs and four out of five people actually follow the sat-nav, which means you need to confidently be able to follow the sat-nav. And the easiest way to do this is always look at the top of the sat-nav. What do you need to focus on while you're following the sat-nav? Now, this is key. This is where it takes a bit of practice. At the, this is a very similar sat-nav to what they use on the driving test, okay? It's a tom-tom. What you need to be looking at is the top bar here, okay? This is what's going to give you the heads up, the anticipation and awareness and planning ahead. So in this case, I know that 600 yards, I'm gonna to come to a roundabout, which I'm going to need to turn right at. Okay, we're gonna assume that's possibly third exit, but even so, I know it's Queensway, okay? So that gives me the awareness that in around 400 yards, I'm going to need to be turning right. Now, even if I'm not aware of how far 200 yards is, 500 yards, it still gives me an idea. I know 500 is a lot bigger than the 100 mark. So all I have to do is watch it go down and see the roundabout coming up and think, Right, this must be the roundabout. And take the third exit. I've got to take the third exit, right. And sat navs are really as simple as that. Don't wait for her to speak, okay? You've got more than one sense. Use your eyes as a visual cue first. Once your eyes are happy with it, then you can wait for the audio cue to help you as well. Again, first thing I do coming off the roundabout, I look for a change in speed. There hasn't been a change in speed. Next thing I'm doing is checking the sat nav. Where am I going? Three quarters of a mile this time, I'm going to be turning right on the roundabout. Anticipation's all about looking out for the signs, looking out and anticipating what's going to happen ahead before it happens. Just like a game of chess, being three, four steps ahead, as many as you can, and that way you're not going to make anywhere near it as many mistakes, because if you plan, if you know what's ahead, you can plan for it, but if you don't know what's ahead, there's no way of actually planning for what to do next. Okay, roundabouts, MSPSL routine. As we are approaching, we check a central mirror. We can have a look in the side mirrors if you like. We're going following the road ahead. Uh, we do our positioning, which is staying to the left because we're going ahead. And we do our speed, which is changing gear. 
we stick, keep our position to the outside of the roundabout and then we check our central left mirror and pop a signal on as we come off um, before the previous, at the end of the previous junction. Very difficult multitasking. So we're coming to a mini roundabout. Now here I'm actually planning to turn right. So I've got a central mirror and a right mirror. Do not signal coming off the roundabout. So it's just a right signal. I check that it's clear to the right and I take the roundabout. I do not need to signal off just because there's not going to be time to actually signal off that's going to be of any benefit to anyone else. Because the roundabout's so small, you treat it more like a junction with signals with just that right signal or just that left signal. Okay, so here we have our first example of a spiral roundabout. Okay, you can tell it's a spiral roundabout because both arrows point straight on, but there is no straight on, which means the only place it can be is right. So what's really important on a spiral roundabout is that you stay in your lane. That is the primary thing with a spiral roundabout. Stay in your lane, whatever happens. Now, most spiral roundabouts are traffic light controlled, but this one isn't, which means you've also got to make sure it's clear. So I'm staying in the outside of the roundabout the whole time. I'm really focused on staying the outside because I'm using the left lane and I have to come off in the left lane. I can't come off in the right lane because that's the lane I chose to enter the roundabout on. That's the difference between a spiral roundabout and a normal roundabout. Now a spiral roundabout will always have arrows, so you'll know which lane to be in. Or well, they do normally have arrows, unless they're rubbed off. So there are four parking maneuvers that you could end up with on your driving test. Even if you don't end up with them, you still need to learn how to park because when you're going Aldi, Tesco, anywhere else, you are going to need to get in that car park safely without causing a nuisance to anyone else. So let's have a look briefly at each of these maneuvers. If you want more details, there is another video in my channel with, in fact, there's lots of videos about each of the maneuvers, so feel free to have a look there. But let's have a brief look at each of them. The important points with a forward bay park are to make sure, first of all, that you are positioned on the opposite side of the car park. Don't worry about sides of the road in a car park when you're parking. It's perfectly normal for you to move to the wrong side of the road if you need to park in a bay. Side of the road to make sure you've got lots of space to the bay. You line your mirror up with the first line of the bay that you're planning to park in. So I want the white line to go straight through the car and straight through just underneath my mirror. Once the, that's the correct position, I'm then going to full lock my wheel in the direction that I want to go, which in this case is there. I then gently lift the clutch up and start to move. Now, this is quite deceiving because on first appearances, it looks like you're not going to end up in the bay. But trust me, if you position that mirror correctly, you will end up in the bay. You continue moving slowly. Do you see how slow that was? Until you look ahead and you can see that you're fairly straight and then you just straighten your wheel. You then continue to move the car forward until you think the front end is inside the bay and then you stop. Next, we're going to do a reverse bay park. Now, there are two methods for this. I'm going to show you the, the easiest method to really learn in. From absolute scratch on a video, this is probably the easiest method. And it's essentially lining up the third white line from your bay. And you want to line it up so it goes approximately through your shoulder or just halfway through your door. This can change slightly depending on your car. So you need to find the reference point in your particular car. In this car, it is around shoulder length. Next, we just gently move the car, well full locked, making sure there's nothing on the other side. And hopefully this will take us inside our bay. You can stop the car as much as you need to on your driving maneuver. Do not panic about that. It's about safety, looking around, not going to hit anyone because this could be a different car park. This could be Tesco, this could be B&M, this could be Aldi. Absolutely rammed. You must be going slow. You must be looking around. You cannot afford to hit another car and you certainly can't afford to hit another person. We are back to looking behind us because that is the direction we are going, not the central mirror. That doesn't show us anything. How many windows can I see out of when I look behind me? Perfect. And that is that. Central mirror, left mirror, signal, moving across ever so slightly before straightening up. The clutch goes down with the brake continuing on until we gently come to a smooth stop. Signal off, handbrake neutral, done. Emergency stop. When the examiner gives you the signal stop, you're gonna stop. So, stop. Stop the car as quickly and safely as you can. 
handbrake, neutral, rest your feet, wait for them to say. When it's safe to do so, drive on. Hand, clutch down, into first, look, 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 look. It's safe, I'm moving away. Parallel parking, let's look at the basics. If you'd like a more in-depth video, there is one in the link somewhere there. Also in the description below. Parallel park is one of the maneuvers that you will be expected to do on your driving test. Could be doing on your driving test, one of the four maneuvers. They will pick one at random. I say random, it's probably pre-planned, but as random as it can be, you won't know until you're on there. So it's very important that you can parallel park. Again, very important if you live uh, in an area which is quite terracy or you don't have your own driveway you may very well need to parallel park so it is a must no skill let's have a very quick look and see what we generally do there are some general easy rules to follow with this the first one is make sure you're around a door's width from the car secondly make sure that the back of your car is just slightly further back than their car then we're going to turn the wheel one way to the left and gently start moving backwards while looking behind us until we're at around a 45 degree angle with the road then we turn the wheel once to the right and continue back while checking our mirror and looking behind us. Then we do another turn to the right and continue on back. And hopefully that'll just bring us round uh, by the curb without hitting the curb. If we do get too close to the curb, all we have to do is just put it into neutral, pop it into first gear and just gently uh, turn the car to the left to bring the front end in, in closer to the curb before straightening back up and stopping the car. Handbrake neutral, Bob's your uncle. Now, we have covered the driving syllabus of everything you should need to get you started on the road as safely as possible. If you do have any questions on it or you'd like to see anything else, please get them in the comments below and I will get back to you ASAP. If this has helped you, please don't forget to share it with your friends. Don't forget to like and of course subscribe and you will see more videos coming your way very soon. Of course, if I've missed anything as well, get that in the comments below and I can only improve on it for future. I am Josh, your humble driving instructor, and I will see you all about. See you all soon. Bye. And I'll